This episode is brought to you by Christendom, a big tent platform for Catholic content creators. Say goodbye to endlessly browsing for Catholic content. At Christendom, we make it simple to follow, share, and save your favorite creator's content. Join our community at Christendom.app. It's free. Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we sort through the highlight of the last week on the Vatican and Global Church beat. You know, we've been doing this show for, I don't know, like around a couple of years. And every week, I keep thinking to myself, someday we're going to have a week where there just really isn't very much to talk about, where very little actually happens. But to quote the mythical, legendary, immortal, and unrepeatable Frieden's Clearwater Revival, someday never comes. At least during the Francis papacy, someday never comes. There is always a rich harvest of things to talk about, so let's dive in. We begin this week with Blackjack. Of course, the object of Blackjack is to get to 21, and that is precisely what Pope Francis did this past Sunday when he appointed 21 new members of the Catholic Church's most exclusive club, the College of Cardinals. We'll sort through why these appointments matter and what they tell us about the today and potentially the tomorrow of the Catholic Church. Second up this week, we have unhappy anniversary. Monday was, of course, the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas that triggered a brutal war in Gaza, which is now threatening to spiral into a wider regional conflict. We'll take stock of where things stand and what the potential is for the Vatican or the Holy See to play a role going forward. Third, wrangling over women. The Synod of Bishops on Synodality is grinding through its closing act this month in Rome. And at the outset, one of the bones of contention has become the role of women in the church. Things began with a senior Vatican official basically delivering a firm niet nine not going to happen to the prospect of women deacons. That has generated a predictable wailing and gnashing of teeth in some quarters. We'll unpack what's going on. Fourth up this week, we have a diplomatic row. Belgium has called in the Pope's ambassador in the country to lodge a protest over what Pope Francis said about abortion when he wasn't even in Belgian airspace anymore. But nevertheless, they objected. We'll explain what the Pope said, why the Belgians are upset about it, and what all this might add up to. And finally this week, we've got Speaking Catholic, wherein we will answer once and for all the perennial question of, is Pope Francis a liberal? All that and more is waiting for you on this episode of Last Week in the Church, so please don't go anywhere because I will be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, October 8th, 2024. Hope all is well wherever you are joining us and however you are joining us, whether it's watching the video on the Crux site, listening to the podcast on your favorite streaming service and device, whatever it is, we're glad you're with us. We begin this week with Blackjack. Now, of course, the object of the game of blackjack is to get to 21 without busting, right? Pope Francis on Sunday hit 21 right on the nose because that is the number of new cardinals, he announced. In a consistory, he said, that he will preside over on December 8th in Rome. December 8th, of course, is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Here in Rome, it is a public holiday. It is widely considered the beginning of the Christmas season in Rome, which stretches, by the way, until January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. So basically, Italians who never need an excuse not to work for most of December and the early part of January have one in the Christmas holidays. So let's begin with the big picture level. What can we say about this crop of 21 new cardinals named by Pope Francis? Well, I think at the big picture level, basically speaking, this, like the other nine consistories Pope Francis has held over the course of his pontificate, 
basically an average of one every year. This, paper, this particular crop of cardinals is distinguished for two things. One, the obvious solicitude for the periphery it exudes. That is, once again, we see Francis reaching out to often neglected or forgotten corners of the globe. I mean, this is a consistory in which there will be cardinals from, just to give you some examples, Peru, Japan, Serbia, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Iran. I mean, like, you could almost throw darts at a map and say, you know, wherever it lands, Francis will sooner or later give that place a cardinal, okay? So the peripheries. And the other distinguishing feature of this consistory, as others that Francis has held, is the way he is rewarding his friends. Either friends in the kind of ideological and political sense, that is, allies who are helping move forward his vision for the future of the Catholic Church. This would be the case, for instance, with the new cardinal in Lima, Peru, Cardinal designate Castillo, Jaime Spengler in Porto Alegre, Brazil, Roberto Repole here in Italy, who is currently the Archbishop of Turin, soon to be the Cardinal of Turin, or friends in the sense of people who have done some particular service for the Pope. So that would include, for instance, Archbishop, soon to be Cardinal Reina, who was formerly the vice regent of the Diocese of Rome. Basically speaking, the Diocese of Rome was in kind of internal turmoil under Cardinal Angelo de Donatus, the Pope's vicar for Rome. Among other things, there were questions about its financial administration and so on. And the Pope turned to Reina to step in to try to help right the ship. And so, as a reward for taking on that difficult task, he now gets a red hat. Or there's, well, everybody in the Vatican calls him Father George. Father George Kukovad. I'm sure I'm butchering that last name, but none of us use it, so I've never had occasion to practice it. But in any event, this smiling Indian, who has been the chief organizer of papal travel, known universally as a really nice guy, another person who has carried water for the Pope and is now getting his reward. By the way, there was something really interesting about that appointment, because Kukabad now will be a cardinal who is reporting to the Sostituto in the Secretary of State, who remains an archbishop, Venezuelan archbishop Edgar Peña Parra. So, I mean, can you imagine staff meetings, right, in which Peña Parra is trying to give instructions, and he looks around the room, and there's a guy there who actually outranks him, okay? This is the kind of irony Pope Francis loves to pull once in a while, just to like, I don't know, I think he takes a secret pleasure in just the consternation that some people feel about this sort of thing. So that's the big picture. It's a consistory that basically rewards the peripheries and the pals of the Pope, which ironically makes the next conclave. And that, of course, is always the question we ask, right? When the Pope names new cardinals, what does this mean for the election of the next Pope, right? Ironically, this mixture of peripheries and pals makes the next conclave both more predictable and more unpredictable at the same moment. It's predictable in the sense that every time the Pope names an ideological or a political ally, to some extent, it increases the odds that the next Pope will be somebody cut from his cloth. On the other hand, every time the Pope names a cardinal from the peripheries, whom we don't know anything about, and we have no idea, you know, what his worldview is, what his priorities might be, what he would be looking for in a pope, it increases the unpredictability of the whole thing. So net, net, I'm not sure we have any more clarity today than we did on Sunday about what the next conclave is likely to do. In the meantime, just one other footnote about this crop. The first name on the pope's list was Archbishop Angelo Acerbi who is a former papal nuncio. He basically served all over the map 
At one point during his career, he was in Colombia where he was kidnapped by rebels and held for six weeks before eventually being freed. The interesting thing about Acerbi is that he is 99 years old. You know, when the Pope named Loris Capavila, the former personal secretary to Pope John XXIII, as a cardinal in 2014 at the age of 98, I thought, okay, that's going to set the all-time record that will never be broken for the oldest guy to get a red hat. Shows you that in the Francis era, never be too dogmatic about anything because surprises are perennially possible. So here we have a Cerebi at the age of 99. I wonder if next year, Pope Francis, just for kicks, is going to look around for some 100-year-old who has a plausible case for becoming a cardinal and give that guy a red hat. We will see. But in the meantime, God bless you, Cardinal Designate Angelo Acerbi. God knows you've waited long enough for this honor. You know, kudos, complimenti, and may you wear this red hat well. All right. So we move on then to our second story this week, which is unhappy anniversary. Monday, of course, was the anniversary of the October 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas. And if we look around at where things stand a year on, two or three things seem abundantly clear. One is that if Hamas thought that it was striking a death blow against Israel by taking those hostages on October 7th, obviously it miscalculated. What it did instead was provoke Israel into a massive, armed response, beginning in the Gaza Strip, but obviously now widening out to some degree. Secondly, it has stoked deep tensions across the Middle East and raised the specter of a kind of quasi-apocalyptic armed conflict between Israel and Iran, in which the United States and potentially other global powers could get swept in. in triggering, in effect, the Third World War. Not in pieces, as Pope Francis likes to say, but in this case, in full-blown, all-at-once form. You know, the third observation, I suppose, would be that of late, Israel's, you might call its counteroffensive, has been showing some signs of success. You know, obviously, the signature success of the Israelis recently was the, the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, one of the co-founders of Hezbollah. But more broadly, there is a perception that Israel has badly degraded the capacity of both Hezbollah and Hamas in the Gaza Strip and elsewhere. That has reduced the ability of Iran to use those groups as proxies to advance its agenda in the Middle East. And all of this has produced a kind of surprising new lease on life for the Netanyahu government in Israel, which not so long ago seemed fated for extinction. What does all this mean in terms of the Vatican's role in the conflict? Well, remember from the very beginning, Pope Francis and his Vatican team have been trying to play the role of a mediator. The Vatican is committed, as many other international players are, to a two-state solution, ultimately, in the Middle East, that is, you know, recognition of Israel's right to exist and security guarantees for Israel, but also full sovereignty for the Palestinians and the recognition of an independent Palestinian state, above all, by Israel. Now, in order to try to promote that agenda, the Vatican and Pope Francis have been trying to remain neutral although the various spats that have arisen over the course of the conflict with Israel would suggest some doubts on the Israeli side about how truly neutral the Vatican and the Holy See really is in all of this. But, you know, what many analysts are saying right now is that the surge, the mini-surge, I guess we should say, in popularity for Netanyahu after the success with the Nasrallah and so on, That has created a moment of opportunity in which Netanyahu is no longer quite as beholden to the ultra-Orthodox settler faction in Israeli politics as he has been up to this point. He has more freedom of movement. So if he wants to be a statesman and not simply a warrior, there is the opportunity here 
to try to move towards some definitive resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And therefore, this might be an opportune moment for Pope Francis and his Vatican team to once again volunteer their services as potential mediators. You'll remember the Camp David Accords in 1978 when the seemingly impossible happened and Egypt and Israel made peace. Can you imagine in 2024 or 2025 a Vatican Garden Accords in which Israel and the Palestinians would finally convert their swords into plowshares? Is that likely? Probably not. Is it possible? This is the Pope Francis era, ladies and gentlemen. Everything and its opposite is possible. As ever, we'll see what happens. All right, third up this week, wrangling over women. So coming in to this final assembly of the Senate of Bishops on Synodality, you know, we knew the role of women in the church was going to be a much talked about, much ballyhooed theme. It had been in the first synod a year ago. It just come up repeatedly in the consultations and so on. And there was some expectation that that conversation might focus on the question of the ordination of women as deacons. However, in the opening days of the synod, well, and first of all, let me just say, nobody who's been paying attention should have taken that prospect seriously anyway, because you would remember last May, Pope Francis gave an interview to CBS in which when he was asked, about the possibility of ordaining women as deacons, said a flat, no, no, can't happen, not going to happen, no. So it should have been off the table at that point. But nevertheless, I mean, that was an interview with the media. You could have, you know, made the argument that that's not magisterial or definitive. And if the Pope were serious, he would have said it in a different way, whatever. So all that leads up to the opening days of this assembly of the Synod of Bishops. When Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, the prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Pope's top in house theologian, gave a talk in which he basically said, Look, we have looked into this question of the ordination of women deacons. We don't see any possibility that that can happen. And so the answer is no. And what we're going to proceed with instead is a study of other ways in which women over the centuries have exercised real power in the church without being ordained. And he, you know, he gave several examples, Catherine of Siena, Bridget of Sweden, and so on, as women who have been centers of power in Catholicism without ever being ordained to anything. Now, that answer did not satisfy many parties who had been hoping that the question would at least be kept open during the course of this Senate. One liberal Catholic reform group on women's issues has already announced plans for a series of protests in Rome, including a theatrical performance on October 12th that I'm kind of intrigued by. Basically, they're going to have actors playing what they describe as, what is it? female bishops and sister pope sitting around having a conversation about whether men are eligible for sacramental ordination. Basically, they're going to take all of the language and church documents about why women can't be ordained and reverse it to be referring to men and see how that sounds. Actually, it seems kind of a clever little spoof. I mean, we'll see how it plays out. But in any event, there is some wailing and gnashing of teeth. One German participant in the Synod who is uh, keeping a blog about his experiences, which, by the way, would seem to violate some of the Synod rules about confidentiality, but apparently no one cares. This guy wrote that after Fernandez gave his presentation to the Synod, there was tremendous disillusionment in the hall, and he said he personally shared that disillusionment. He said he felt like a wet poodle which I guess is a German reference for something. Go ask a German what the hell that means. But I guess it's not good anyway. And, and so forth and so on. Now, how serious this reaction will be as the Senate goes forward remains to be seen, I suppose, to some extent. It depends on whether other possibilities for empowering women are presented that seem credible, real, and promising. But in any event, it does suggest 
that discussions of women's roles in the church is and will remain one of the flashpoints for this synod, and it certainly will be one of the litmus tests people will be using at the end to try to discern whether the synod was a boom or a bust, whether it was more sizzle or more steak, right? We will see how all that plays out, but at least what we now have is some degree of clarity. That clarity is ain't going to happen on female deacons, so the action is going to be somewhere else. The question is, will this synod provide new insight as to where that somewhere else and something else might be? All right, fourth up this week, we have diplomatic row. So Pope Francis, in his customary airborne news conference on the way home from his recent September 26th to the 29th trip to Luxembourg and Belgium, was asked about the fact that while he was in Belgium, he made a previously unannounced visit to the tomb of the late King Baudouin of Belgium and made some remarks praising Baudouin, particularly for the fact that in 1990, Baudouin had resigned as king for a day rather than sign in the law a measure legalizing abortion in Belgium. So, one of the Belgian journalists on the papal plane asked the Pope about that. And in response, Pope Francis used rhetoric that he often has in the past. Speaking about abortion, he said, you know, let us be clear, abortion is murder. It is the taking of a human life. And further, he said that doctors who perform abortions, he used the Italian word, sicari, sicari. And in Italian, sicari basically means assassins, hitmen, right? So he was saying doctors who perform abortions are basically hitmen. Now, again, I say he has used this rhetoric before, so there was nothing in principle unusual about him using it in this context. However, because it came on the heels of his trip to Belgium, and because Belgium currently has a measure before Parliament, that would expand legal access to abortion from 12 to 18 weeks, and it is sort of a hot potato in Belgian politics at the moment. Belgians took all this as an attempt by the Pope to interfere in their domestic affairs, or at least that was the line taken by Prime Minister Alexander de Croo, who you will remember when the Pope was in Belgium, publicly took him to the woodshed over the church's clerical sexual abuse scandals, saying, you know, cover-ups can no longer be tolerated, you know, transparency is the only way to go, and the church can't deal with its future until it cleans up its past, that kind of thing, as if the Pope needed a lesson, I suppose, on the legacy of the abuse scandals. But in any event, uh, the same de Croo, on the back of the Pope's comments on abortion, stormed into the, well, I don't know if he stormed in, but anyway, he went into the Belgian parliament and announced that he was going to be summoning the Vatican ambassador, that's the papal nuncio in Belgium, to lodge a formal protest over what he regarded as unacceptable interference by the head of a foreign state in Belgium's domestic affairs. I don't know whether as of this broadcast that meeting has already taken place, I don't think this augurs, by the way, you know, some kind of rupture or break in diplomatic relations between Belgium and the Vatican. Nevertheless, it certainly represents a hiccup or a sort of unusual flashpoint in this relationship. I would simply make two observations about all of this. One, it is somewhat curious I mean, I get why the Belgians would take all this personally, but I would point out this is not something Pope Francis actually said in Belgium. He said this on the papal plane, and the way this works is, you know, you get in the air for about a half hour or so, usually, before the Pope comes back to start the presser. And so by the time they got to this question, and by the time the Pope actually delivered his response, the papal plane was well outside of Belgian airspace. So he wasn't even physically in the country when he said this. And secondly, I would point out, this was hardly rhetoric crafted specifically for Belgium. As I've already said, this is part of kind of a standard trope 
for Francis whenever the issue of abortion comes up. So, question, you know, did the Pope consciously intend a poke in the eye to the nation of Belgium and to attempt to steer or influence its parliamentary debate? Almost certainly not. Could he perhaps have been more circumspect? Could he have said at the beginning, I am not speaking about Belgium now or generally, something like that? Possibly. But perhaps the third question that needs to be asked is, was De Croo and were the Belgians just looking for a fight? And based on all the evidence from what happened during the trip and the aftermath, the answer to that question is quite plausibly, yeah, that's kind of what they were on the market for. All right, finally, this week, we come to the question of speaking Catholic. So, also in that airborne press conference, the Pope was asked about the, some blowback he had in Belgium over his rhetoric on women. And among other things, whether he was espousing a kind of conservative view about women's rules. Basically, he poo-pooed this notion. He basically said that if, I'm a con if my views on this are conservative, then I'm, he used the name of a famous French-Argentine tango musician, which is basically a colloquial way of saying he found the whole concept completely absurd. Now, I note the irony. Who is most likely to agree when Pope Francis says out loud, I am not a conservative? You know who's most likely to agree with that? Catholic conservatives, who have been saying for 11 years, this guy is not one of us, and who are probably thrilled to have the Pope on record publicly acknowledging it. Now, if it is true that Pope Francis is, you know, essentially speaking, more on the left than the right, and if that has been the tenor of his papacy for these 11 years, then how is it that he found himself in the position of having to deny that he has a conservative attitude about women? I would suggest it is the difference between speaking secular and speaking Catholic, okay? From a secular point of view, that is, you know, what mainstream meat and potatoes, non-Catholic or non-practicing anyway, Americans or Western Europeans think a liberal is supposed to be. A liberal means somebody who is pro-choice, somebody who is pro-LGBTQ+, including pro-gay marriage, and who is pro-women's rights, including seeing any group, including a church, that denies women positions of leadership as retrograde and patriarchal, right? That's the secular definition of a liberal. And by that standard, folks, there are no liberals in the Catholic Church, at least at the senior levels, right? That is, among the bishops. I mean, there are no openly pro-choice, pro-gay marriage, pro-women's ordination bishops. Now, if we're speaking Catholic, on the other hand, okay, the, the distinction between left and right is not so much in terms of doctrine, but how you apply it. So a more progressive Catholic bishop would say on abortion, ah, hey, you know, maybe we talk too much about this, maybe we can focus on other things, and, you know, we shouldn't condemn, we shouldn't judge would say much the same things about these other contested points. To put the point differently, judgments of left and right depend on where you put the center. In secular culture, the center is defined by public opinion. In Catholicism, the center is defined by the catechism. So, in answer to the immortal question, is Pope Francis a liberal? The correct answer is, yes, he is, as long as we're speaking Catholic. That, by the way, is key to understanding a lot of things in the church not merely the Pope. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. I will be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. So be with us. Tell your friends and neighbors. Let's build that audience. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. And I will talk to you again very, very soon.